Wonderful. Great. A very brief introduction. You need an introduction. Uh, well, OK. We okay. Could, <laughs> we'll take whatever we can get. <clears throat> This is a very exciting day for us here at the Aspen Institute. This is our inaugural event in our new headquarters. And so we're very happy to welcome you to the new headquarters of the Aspen Institute. And we're very happy to start this entire experience off with the Gildenhorn book series. And we offer many thanks to Alma Gildenhorn and to Joe Gildenhorn for uh, inspiring the series and getting it off the ground. Uh, we have some lighting issues, so we don't have to, you didn't have to put on makeup today, David. Uh, <laughs> David's. Um, you. And so we're still working out some quirks, so if you see some paint chips here and there, just kind of give us some time. But we're very happy to be here, and we hope that you'll visit this space and see all the other conference rooms that we have as well. Our two speakers really need no introduction, because they've been very much a part of the Aspen life and a part of your lives. Uh, David, who deals masterfully with reality, but also you're pretty good at making up stuff as well. <laughs> Try to tell the difference. This is a great book. And then, of course, uh, we also have with us another David who you know through the Washington Post. And they've been featured individually in our book series. David has a book coming out in June. And they've been very actively involved in the life of the Aspen Institute, primarily the Aspen Strategy Group. And I think we featured the two of you together at a board meeting. So David Sanger, David Ignatius, needing no introduction, but welcome to the Aspen Institute. Happy to have you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with my friend David, to be out at the um, first event in this beautiful um, new space. I'm kind of missing that big pillar we all had to go look around at the previous one. <laughs> Um, our thanks to Alma and, of course, to Joe for this great series. Uh, and um, this is a really fun book. This may be actually one of the most fun books we've had a chance to go talk about uh, at these, because we, you know, we do a lot of really serious books uh, around here. And this has got a lot of serious themes to it, but it's a really fun read. And I always tell David that um, he's... Um, my favorite novelist, not only because he's a good friend, but because he writes books that are enjoyed by both my 23-year-old son and my 94-year-old dad. And I said, if you can span that, that, that demographic, you've got it made, right? So um, The Quantum Spy, we'll, we'll hear about uh, in a bit. It is a spy novel um, set here in Washington, in Singapore, in Beijing. It's basically spent every place you would see if you could read David's expense accounts. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, if some of the restaurants where some of this takes place are pretty good, I bet the, the expense accounts are pretty good too, right? <laughs> so um, the descriptions are great. Um, but what we thought we'd do is this. We're going to sort of have a conversation in three parts. Um, part one is going to be a little bit about the book itself, which came out in November, David, do I have that right? Yes. Right? Um, and a little bit about the characters in them. And then we're going to try to shift that seamlessly to some of the themes that David is really touching on in the real world, in U.S.-China relations, in the dealings of the intelligence community with China, in the competition between uh, the Ministry of State Security in China and uh, the CIA, which is the backdrop of this book, and a little bit of some of the challenges that they are facing now. And then we're going to open it up uh, to all of you for your questions, either on um, the fictional world that Ignatius uh, describes here, or the real world that Ignatius is describing here. And I can tell you uh, that they are separated by about four degrees. <laughs> so, there you go. So, David, let me start with the, the lead character um, in the book, a Dr. Ma, who has basically everything you would want a Chinese computer scientist to have. A, an MIT degree, right, from his days coming here where we were teaching him. Um, Odd, murky connections to Chinese intelligence. Um, cash in large sums hidden in numbered bank accounts around the world. 
and a mistress in Vancouver. I mean, like, what more could he possibly need? He's got, <laughs> he's got the full, the full suite. Um, so I, just to say at the outset how glad I am to be here with my friend uh, David. Uh, I see many friends in the audience, but I want to just know one uh, in particular, and that's Alma uh, Gilmore, who, who has uh, been uh, a sponsor of this program. Um, I think novelists are not normally invited to, these, to this uh, book series, but I seem to have gotten a special pass Thanks to uh, my uh, uh, patron, Alma. So, Alma, thank you uh, for this and so many things you do. Um, this book uh, does open uh, in Singapore uh, after an introductory tease uh, chapter with a, a Chinese uh, scientist, uh, specialist in quantum computing, who uh, yes, has studied at MIT, but I note uh, because Alma's here, and it's also in the book, um, got his doctorate at uh, the University of Maryland, which has emerged as a great center for quantum computing. They have their own special center. It's really a, one of the world leaders. And uh, Dr. Ma, uh, after returning to China and having a life as a technologist, has been seconded by the Academy of Sciences to the Ministry of State Security, the Chinese Intelligence Service, where he is a technical advisor to the directorate that works on advanced computing, in particular quantum computing. In real life, as in this novel, the Chinese have decided that this is the commanding heights of the future of technology, and they have put enormous effort into it. They've built uh, the world's largest quantum computing research center, $10 billion facility. Uh, Xi Jinping has visited their quantum computing laboratories. He spoke about quantum computing in his famous uh, two-hour address to the party congress back in uh, October, November. So this is a genuinely big deal for China. And my fict fictional imaginary character, Dr. Ma, is part of that. Like so many, uh, one's tempted to say, like nearly all senior Chinese officials, he has been making some money on the side. As China has exploded into this uh, wealthy country, it's, it's been impossible for people uh, in senior positions, in the party, in the military, to resist uh, the opportunity to export some capital. It's, it's a sign of the underlying mistrust that Chinese officials have about their own system, that they want to get some of those millions that they're making out of the country into foreign bank accounts. In this case, Dr. Ma has his money in Luxembourg, and he does have his mistress in Vancouver. Uh, and he has, he has expensive uh, needs. And guess who knows about that? The CIA knows about that. Uh, the, the vulnerability of senior Chinese officials uh, who are on take and who now, with Xi Jinping running an anti-corruption campaign, once upon a time to say that Chinese officials were taking money on the side was like so. Uh, but there is now a, what's called the Discipline Inspection Commission. And they have taken down, I, in the other day in a column I, I had a count, there were 15,000 military officers who've been uh, sacked, including 400 general officers. Uh, there are 1.5 million party members who've been disciplined for corruption offenses. I think I'm remembering this right, that 250,000 roughly, maybe it's 350,000, have actually been prosecuted. So a whole generation uh, of China's leadership in the military, in the party, uh, has been removed by Xi uh, on uh, corruption grounds, including, and this is the fun of my novel, including the top leadership of their intelligence service, which has been a principal target of Xi Jinping's uh, attacks. They've had two vice ministers replaced. They've been in tumult. So in my fictional world, it's a perfect hunting ground for the CIA to try to recruit you know, one of these officers and 
the book opens in, in Singapore, I'll, I'll end this introductory comment by saying, the problem if you're a novelist is you got all these ideas, you've been reading about quantum computing and you're you know, reading about the Ministry of State Security and think, ah, that's great, but it's all you know, newspaper reading. Uh, it's not a novel yet. And you need to see that moment where the characters come to life in your mind and, and then begin to live the story through your imagination. And I just was stuck. I'd been working on this for six, eight months. And I did take a trip to Singapore. And I was in a, a room that's identical to the one described in the opening scene. And suddenly, I saw my character, Dr. Ma, moving in space in my imagination. And on the long flight back from Singapore, I just was pounding my laptop because I suddenly I got it. I knew I knew how the book's like, you know, one of those pachinko balls that starts starts at the top and click 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 click. And it does just once it gets going, it finds its its own level and gets to the bottom. So, uh, yes, David, that character is that is a fictional character, but um, drawn from all these things that are going on in in real life China. I, I'm so jealous because I'm sitting here working on a nonfiction book that relates to sci to cyber issues, and I'm worrying about footnotes. And I'm realizing that when you do this novel, you it takes a while to picture them in the hotel room, but you never have to footnote it. <laughs> you, you never you never have to footnote it. And uh, the, the one thing that you live in fear of, obviously, uh, is that you're going to get it wrong and embarrass yourself, especially if you're like me, a non-technologist, writing about the most esoteric technology there is. Well, that, that takes us to quantum computing. So um, we, we can't avoid it, but you guys are getting a free lunch at the Aspen Institute. You have to emerge <laughs> thinking that you, know, that you now know something about quantum computing. So the main thing to know about quantum computing is that for all these debates we've been having about encryption and whether or not Apple should let the FBI and all that, the day you actually get a working quantum computer, it doesn't make any difference what encryption techniques we have put together, because they will all fall in a millisecond. So tell us a little bit about quantum computing. So uh, as David says, it, do, it does have that power, uh, that computational power. Anything that involves uh, heavy computation, where you'd be applying supercomputers and the way it's it said you crack uh, uh, codes is to take these enormous uh, numbers and try to factor them. And with brute force, uh, you know, a supercomputer attack using a conventional computer, it takes thousands of years. It's not, it's not possible. It is said that because of the nature of the quantum computer that I'll explain in a minute, what would take thousands of years and is undoable with any classical computing architecture can be done in a matter of seconds or, or minutes, but pretty much instantly with a quantum computer. So um, no encryption scheme can withstand it, no payment system that Visa or anybody else uh, thinks of uh, could withstand it. I, I have said at other uh, sessions that uh, if you read uh, that uh, quantum computing really is about to, to get started, um, might be a good time to sell your Bitcoin. Uh, because it, 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 there is the, the computational power to, in, in the intelligence sense, break anything. Um, there are also are wondrous um, non-intelligence applications, uh, designing uh, drugs, seeing the complicated molecular structure of, of the things that might uh, cure diseases, uh, creating new materials, these things that take uh, extraordinary uh, computing power. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's uh, something that's, that is going to be world changing. Why is it so powerful? I, I, again, I'm not a technologist, but I'll give you this simple uh, layman's answer. Every computer that we've ever uh, used is made up of bits that are either zero or one. They're kind of open or closed. It's this basic architecture. And through the genius of the chip fabricators and the people who program uh, these, these, these systems, we're able to, to compute almost anything with the array of, of bits that are zero or one. Quantum computers are made up of qubits that 
in the quantum way are simultaneously 0 and 1, both. That sounds impossible, but you know, we know from quantum physics that that's the nature of, of, of matter, and it's that uh, quantum property that a quantum computer e exploits. The problem is that these qubits are incredibly unstable. They decohere, they collapse uh, in a matter of milliseconds. So a big part of building a quantum computer is uh, uh, shielding it. These computer architectures are housed in super low temperature. Cryogenics, the science of very low temperature uh, environments is, is one of the pathways that's essential to com computing. When I was working on this book, I went to a, a company in Vancouver that uh, claims it has built a quantum computer. There's a lively debate about whether that's true or not. But I, I watched what the founder of this company said as we walked into his lab was the, the coldest place on earth, which is this you know super cold, they use technology to draw off heat using uh, gases and complicated uh, technologies. But it was, uh, at the time I was watching, 20 millikelvin. Deep space, I think, is like, you know, twice that. It, it, anyways, it's, it's really cold. So at this, they, they put the quantum chip with all these little qubits in this super cold environment. It's also shielded from any other kind of interference, heat, radiation. And the idea is to keep these qubits going, keep them from decohering long enough that they can do calculation. And that's really, that's the heart of what this challenge is. Um, just to say a final thing about why it's so powerful. In this, it's either zero or one architecture, you're doing your problem solving sequentially. It's incredibly fast, you know, to, it was just, you know but it's sequential. It is said that if you could build the quantum qubit architecture, you're essentially solving problems with simultaneous calculation in every direction. And that's why it's, it's so fast. You're almost testing uh, every possible answer to get the right one. So uh, that's the extra credit problem. You don't have to take any more, uh, any more tutorials. Um, so, um, so David, so Dr. Ma here, without giving away too much of it, but just in the setup, he has been working on this. And there's a line I'm going to read to you from early in the book so that we're not revealing too much and forcing everybody to get on their phones here and, and, and um, order it up uh, you know, as we speak. Um, so the CIA officer, is, uh, whose name is Harris Chang, who's himself a Chinese-American uh, officer, and we'll come back to that in a minute because it gets to some, one of the interesting sub-themes of the book, um, is pressing him on what it is he's doing in the United States, what he's trying to get at. Of course, he in, initially says he's just like you know, a, country, uh, a, a country computer scientist who's sort of messing around until it becomes clear that the CIA knows he's involved in quantum. And he says, we try to penetrate the American quantum programs that became classified, the ones that go black. Those are our targets. This knowledge keeps our ministry in business. He's referring to the Ministry of State Security and seems to suggest, as you suggested about Xi, that Xi would do away with the Ministry of State Security, or at least with its top leadership, save for the fact that, as, as um, Dr. Ma says, as long as we have this knowledge, we survive. So while there is an international element of the competition between uh, the US and China here, there's also a, the bureaucratic and political inside China because the knowledge of quantum computing is what means his ministry will live. Um, and you notice the Chinese don't shut their government down. So no, they don't. <laughs> so, um, so tell us a little bit about uh, here what you learned the Ministry of State Security and the CIA that made this the sort of spine of the book. And the question, why would we ever want to take a quantum computer project black? Because at that moment, you're cutting out a huge amount of the talent that could be working on it, as we discover later in the book. So, so um, 
the, uh, the competition in this novel is, uh, yes, uh, it's a race between the United States and China, the CIA and the Ministry of State Security, to get to this technological high ground first. And there's a very deliberate uh, analogy to the Manhattan Project, the race between the, the US and Germany, really, to get the secret of making a nuclear weapon. Um, there's also competition uh, in this novel between the Ministry of State Security and other elements of the intelligence bureaucracy in China, in particular parts of the PLA. PLA 2 is their kind of uh, general intelligence department. PLA 3 does cyber and communications intelligence. And you know we know uh, about bureaucratic rivalry and competition. My dad used to say, uh, you know, the, the Navy never forgets who the real enemy is, the Air Force. Um, and, uh, you know, in, uh, CIA and FBI rivalry, well known, I mean, tragically so, as we saw after 9-11. I mean, it is, you know, it's a hideous fact that every, every piece of information needed to crack that plot was in the system, but wasn't shared between CIA and FBI. So there's something similar in, in, in China, and through this book, the way in which the CIA, a very clever CIA officer who's Harris Chang's boss, John Vandal, is seeking to exploit the rivalry between the Ministry of State Security and the PLA as one of the engines uh, uh, drive, driving the book. Um, I think, uh, I've come to think that Xi Jinping is really the most effective leader on the world stage today, in part because he keeps taking on immensely difficult challenges, trying to deal with corruption in one of the most corrupt countries on earth. You know, you think it's just too heavy a lift. I think he's basically pulled it off. I keep waiting for the hard landing of the Chinese economy. It's got this unbelievable debt overhanging its state-owned enterprises, its bank. I keep waiting for it to, to crash, and it doesn't. The quality of uh, macroeconomic planning, uh, you know, I talk to Chinese central bankers, I'm amazed at how, what a good job they do. And in this intelligence area, uh, as we're learning, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we're, we're discovering that the level of intensity and sophistication of their intelligence attack on our, our secrets, on, on people in the intelligence community and on these big secrets, uh, has, has been extraordinary. Um, just to open this up, and then David, I, I want to bounce this back to you, because you know more about this than any journalist. A, a theme that underlies this book is how should the American government uh, organize research into these cutting edge technologies? As I explained, quantum computing has enormous national security importance. Does that mean that we ought to classify you know, the, the, the most effective pathways, because it's just so important they have to be secret. Or, as the heads of research at many of the private companies almost pleaded to me as I was doing my research, do we need to keep them open? Do we need to keep the labs that Microsoft is running, that, uh, that uh, Google is running, that, you know, our great universities, open to Chinese postdocs, uh, the, the smartest, students from, from China, from wherever, Russia, you name it, because that's our secret sauce. That's how we have, that's the engine of our uh, te technology success is that we're open. When we classify things, they slow down. It's like pouring, you know, uh, 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 maple syrup and it's just everything slows down. So, you know, David, I put back to you the question, I don't answer it in the book, but is it is it wiser to keep these systems open. Take quantum computing as an example. So, you know, free flow of graduate students, yeah, you know, we welcome the, the, the smartest uh, person coming out of Xinhua University. Uh, or do we need to close them off? Well, just looking at the history of this, the government run programs to close them off have had a few notable successes. Satellite industry is one to go look at where we manage with classified systems to come up with incredible spy satellites. But the fact of the matter is that the intelligence community, to my mind, 
be interested to see if you come to the same conclusion, hasn't gotten its head around the fact that as everything in the world has sped up, so has all of this private research. So the chances that you could seal something off and to assure that you stay ahead and then really stay ahead, I think is something of a fantasy out here. And you know, one way to think about this, we're now consumed by many of the cyber threats you describe in here. And yet if you go back to 2007, just 10, 11 years ago, and you look at the um, Director of National Intelligence um, threat assessment that comes out each year, the public threat assessment, you won't find cyber in it, right? It's been number one for what, the past four or five years. So that tells you how much the government is frequently playing catch up, while many in private industry sort of understood where some of this was going. And so it doesn't strike me that closing off the basic research on this or even the development of the machines is, terribly, is likely to be terribly successful. I could imagine classifying some specific applications, but with the recognition that, you know, the idea that you would keep the secret for, what, 25 years, which is what's usual with this bet, you know, you'd be lucky to keep it secret for 25 months. The um, fact that cyber threats were not noted in public documents in 2007, just to note, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, our government wasn't working very aggressively on it. I, I mean, there's every indication that back then the NSA didn't want people to talk about cyber threats because it basically was just you know buying up every every wire it could, mm -hmm. so to speak. And uh, so I I just I just note that that um, no, they were. My sense and, is the U.S. was early it. and aggressive in this area, and we've been living off of the fruits of that in in, in some ways ever since. Um, so let's go to one of the other interesting themes that comes out of the characters in the, in the book. So Harris Chang is this CIA officer who's on to Dr. Ma and trying to work this whole thing out. But in the background is the thought that here is a Chinese-American CIA officer whose own loyalties are a bit questioned within the organization and we've seen that happen in real life in recent times, actually even in the past week uh, with the uh, arrest of a, of a former um, uh, officer who showed up at Kennedy Airport uh, and discovered that he had been uh, indicted under seal uh, for allegedly helping the Chinese identify um, if you the indictment is sort of hard to read, as we were discussing before. They've taken out almost all the interesting stuff. But, but when you talk to people, the story is that he helped identify American assets uh, to the Chinese. Um, tell us a little bit about Chang's struggles with this and what it tells you about the real agency. So Harris Chang uh, is a fourth generation, fourth generation uh, Chinese American. Uh, he grew up in Flagstaff, Arizona, where his uh, grandfather came to work on the railroads uh, after having originally come for that same reason uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century. Uh, he, uh, as he says at one point, he bleeds red, white, and blue. He went to West Point. He joined the Army. He served in Iraq. Uh, he is as assimilated as American and American as you can be. But he discovers that his CIA colleagues see his ethnic background as central to his operational usefulness. And in the beginning, that doesn't bother him a lot, but it begins to bother him more and more that he just keeps seeing that he's uh, viewed in terms of his stereotyped ethnic background by the people he's working with. He's also seen that way by the Chinese he's working against, who, who see his ethnic background as a lock that they can turn uh, to 
begin to exploit and manipulate him. And I won't go into the details of, of how they do that, but um, Chinese historically have been brilliant at uh, playing on this, this factor. There are a whole series of espionage cases. David Wise wrote a, a very good uh, book, I think, called the, uh, the Tiger Trap, which summarizes the FBI cases going back over the last 15, 20 years. We have, in, as David said, in the last week, um, a major uh, espionage case uh, has uh, begun, because I think this one's got a ways to run still, with a Chinese-American uh, named uh, Jerry Chenxing Li. Jerry Chenxing Li, like Harris Chang, served in the US Army and then joined the CIA um, in 1994 and served in the agency for 13 years. After he left in 2007, he went to work for a Japanese company, and it is said in the New York Times, which has had just brilliant reporting on this, I have to, have to say, you can just sort of, it's been stunning, um, was in contact with Chinese intelligence officers Interestingly, the FBI had him under surveillance in 2012. When he came back, he was living overseas, having quit the CIA in 2007, he's living overseas, comes to Hawaii, and we know from the affidavit of the FBI agent uh, that was submitted along with his indictment that the FBI had him under surveillance, uh, looked at his, his, what he was bringing with him, and found classified information at that time, but did not arrest him. And he went uh, back uh, overseas. I think he was living in Hong Kong. And we still don't know exactly how this happened, but this person who's been under suspicion since at least 2012 takes a trip to New York, and he gets off the plane uh, a couple weeks ago, and bam! There's the FBI, and he's arrested. Uh, the indictment is is very thin. He's charged with a you know one uh, relative. He's not charged with treason. He's charged with one relatively minor um, count. Um, but this is a case that matters. I mean, you know, think of the scariest John Le Carre novel, where you know where people end up being killed. The whole networks of people. That's what happened in this case. Uh, the New York Times has written that initially it thought 10 to 12, the number now it seems to be up to 20 people who had been uh, assets of the CIA in China were discovered and removed. I mean, that's a lot of people uh, who risked their lives for the United States. Bam. So uh, is this person responsible? That's we, it's not alleged in the in the indictment. The indictment's much much narrower. Um, there, there's some really interesting, complicated questions about the technology that's used to communicate with our assets. If you read spy novels that are better than mine, you know that there are short range communications devices that are used for agent communications in Beijing or, or Moscow. Were those frequencies techniques disclosed? Um, were uh, CIA personnel uh, uh, tagged by the Chinese and then watched? And how much of this involves Li and how much other people? But it, it's, um, stay tuned on this one because it's, it's going to be a, a really big, uh, I think, unfolding story. And as I say, it has real life and death stakes. Uh, some very brave people who, who decided they wanted to help the United States uh, seem to have been killed. Let me take you a little bit away from the novel for a moment and just talk a bit about where we are with the Chinese. So we had a president who um, took office a year ago um, this weekend, promising a broad, new, incredibly tough set of trade positions against the Chinese brought in a um, commerce secretary who's got um, a lot of China connections and a lot of depth 
probably of the, of the members of the cabinet, the one most connected in some ways to dealing with the Chinese, uh, although he's had to endure leaks and news stories suggesting that he fell asleep at cabinet meetings. Not sure that's an all bad thing, but you know. <laughs> um, and uh, people shouldn't meet, the cabinet shouldn't meet after lunch. Uh, and uh, you then had the president say, oddly enough, why would I go penalize the Chinese on trade if they're helping me on North Korea? Which, was, which breached this usual separation that we've had, that we can have a trade relationship and we have a national security relationship and while the two speak to each other, you don't tend to swap one off for the other. But with the great negotiator, you might. Um, and this has led a lot of people to suggest to me an enormous confusion within US policymaking about what the president's real agenda is here. Does he want to do all the trade things that he said he did in the campaign, where he was pretty graphic about it? Is North Korea something where the Chinese can play Donald Trump by seeming to crack down on the North Koreans, but not do it so strongly that they would actually trigger collapse? What's your read? Well, I, I think on this, as on many subjects, um, President Trump's policy is going uh, in many directions at once. And um, the contradictions may be self-defeating. Uh, that said, to have a president who went from saying that China was raping America in trade during the campaign, most extreme kind of rhetoric, to having uh, almost a love-in meeting with Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago, and then the Chinese reciprocated when uh, Trump went to uh, Beijing in uh, November, the uh, best visit any any leader has ever had to China. You know, every time she comes up, I have a great relationship with she. I was, you know, so uh, she is obviously the kind of person that President Trump thinks he can get along with, thinks he can make deals with, thinks he can, you know, th threaten, but have a, a, an instrumental. Uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Relationship, and he's put uh, the uh, trade relationship. Um, on the table, although it's interesting, after all this talk about the threat of Chinese trade, our, our trade imbalance th this last year is the largest in history. It's went up significantly from what it has been before the Get Tough Guy came in. Um, the, uh, I should say that I think uh, that the decisions that uh, President Trump has made in general about working with and through China to deal with North Korea are correct. I think that's the right approach. Uh, it was going to take something. I mean, everybody in the last few administrations who's wanted to deal with the North Korea problem has thought China is the way to, to get that done with very little success. My sense is that Trump has had a little bit more success. The, we've had now two significant UN Security Council resolutions passed with Chinese support. The Chinese are slowly squeezing the North Korean economy. What I hear from people who have diplomatic missions there is that there is, yeah, it's getting a little tight in, uh, in Pyongyang. So the slow squeeze approach uh, has had some benefits. Uh, we'll see what happens after the Olympic pause. Uh, you know, we kind of put the nuclear crisis on hold for the moment, and then we'll come back to it. And, uh, March, April. Um, I just would note one other interesting contradiction. Even as the president is talking about how Xi Jinping is his best friend and they have a great relationship and all that, other parts of the U.S. government have gotten very concerned about China. Now, I've been watching, as David has, the last two years, two, three years, but really the last couple of years, the most senior and thoughtful people uh, at the Pentagon both uniform military and civilian advisors, concluding that China poses a threat to the United States, the likes of which we've really never seen. You know, they're rich, they're technologically powerful, they're on their way to dominating the technologies that will change warfare, and they, they, they're serious about it. Uh, they, they glitter with success. This is not Russia, that kind of ridiculous, drab Moscow. I mean, they'd really want to 
work for, for the Soviets in the old days. This is, this is different. And so they begun ringing the alarm bell. And the National Security Council is now organizing, David and I were at an event a week ago at the Council on Foreign Relations where we got a rollout of you know, an, a, a government-wide effort to deal with Chinese influence operations. The Chinese are rich and powerful and intimidate the heck out of universities, movie studios, uh, you know, go down the list of all the institutions that they, with their power, can. So, so that's that's happening, and I think our government, David, tell me if you think I'm wrong about this. Even as President Trump talks about how great his relationship is, our government's getting much more serious about the China kind of threat. I mean, I have to say the China problem. Well, all you have to do is look at the new national defense strategy that came out on Friday. Uh, got a lot less um, discussion than it probably should have because it happened in the midst of the whole show of the shutdown drama. But what did it say? It essentially said that the United States defense posture has to get back to superpower competition, that Russia and China were both revisionist powers. I'm not sure I would sign on to that. I would say China might be a Russia sort of a declining power that's trying to get back a little bit of the old Soviet glory, and that this had to, to um, overtake terrorism as the primary mission of the US government. Well, if you had said that during the Bush era, you would have been crucified in the, uh, if you were in the Defense Department. If you had said it during the Obama era, the Republican opponents of the president would have said, you're weak on terrorism, you're not focusing on the number one threat to the US. And here, at a time you have a president who has not said anything particularly nasty about the Russians, and as you've just described so well, is conflicted about the Chinese, you've got a defense secretary who's come out and said Russia and China are our number one problems. Well, I, I think that um, judgment, um, driven by Secretary Mattis, but shared, uh, throughout the government, it's, it's a big change. Uh, and uh, we're, we're in a, it's, in a, it's a diff, different period. We're, we're next gonna be thinking about the, the weapon systems that can uh, put the, this potential adversary on its back foot. And they've got a lot of ideas. Uh, David and I were talking earlier, I, we're just on the edge of a whole new generation of of weapons that, you know, that will be science fiction, you know, lasers that are, can be carried and drones that hover over, you know, you just go down the list of wild technologies, autonomous uh, robots that, you know, seaborne, airborne uh, on land that, that can just seek out, just right. You wanna uh, have some fun, uh, go look at robot videos uh, on, on YouTube or, uh, ask your friends, ask your kids uh, to find them. There's a company in Boston called Boston Dynamics, I think. But uh, So you'll see a robot that can do a backflip. Imagine that. From a standing start, the robot can do a backflip. It's a huge robot. This, another version of this robot can walk down a snowy slope in Massachusetts in midwinter the ground is uneven, you, you, know, you and I would st stumble and fall down. The robot keeps his balance. It's the damnedest thing. <laughs> so you will look at those videos and you, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see a hundred or a thousand of them, you know, marching across the field and that's the future warfare. So, uh, and the Chinese know that as well as we do. Interestingly, this company that I just was talking about has just been bought by Japan. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's it's um, the we're in the early phase of thinking about dealing with China as an adversary. David and I will be writing about that for the rest of our careers. I fear. I suspect right. Let me ask one last question, then we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, so as you mentioned, we're in this sort of Olympic pause with North Korea. North Koreans have done this pretty brilliantly, right? They've immediately recognize that President Moon, uh, the South Korean leader, there's a lot of space between him and Donald Trump. 
They've done the whole Korean unity thing. They're going to march into the into the opening uh, of the Olympics uh, next week or two weeks from now with a unified team playing a piece of Korean folk music that appeals on both sides of the border. If you are looking for a way to uh, stop the, um, the uh, president of the United States from doing a unilateral attack on uh, North Korean missile or nuclear sites, I can't think of a more of a better way to do it than to completely embrace the U.S.'s main ally here. So tell me how you think this plays out once the Olympics are over. Do we go back to the status quo, or have they actually managed to pull something off here? Well, they, they certainly have reset the table. And uh, one thing I've learned uh, since you know, December, but really over the last year, is that uh, Kim Jong-un, who's it just sort of looks like a comic book villain, this you know, fat guy with a bad haircut, um, and he is a very clever strategist. Uh, and he has done, just, just as you described, David, he, he um, with his New Year's Day speech, conciliatory, respectful towards South Korea, has invited South Korea's cooperation, has chosen the Olympic moment. Why is he doing all this? I mean, that's the worst, the worst part of this. He's doing it because he knows, and we know, that he has achieved nuclear status. And we talk about trying to prevent him from getting there. It's, I'm afraid we, we, we missed that one. Uh, he, he now essentially has those capabilities. There are a couple more tests he'd like to do. If we go back to big military exercises, he probably will do them. But he's there, and so he speaks like somebody who's a member of the nuclear club. So, and he's basically saying, what are you going to do about it? And he now has, you know, this is uh, uh, wingman, you know, companion in the Olympic march, uh, President Moon in, in South Korea. So I think he, it's been, it's been very clever. We have some great allies in that part of the world, too. Japan is a fabulous ally. I think South Korea has worked hard to stay uh, on side in insisting that it, it will go forward only if there's recognition of the need for denuclearization of the peninsula. So they, you know, although they're marching together, South Korea's, I think, tried to insist this is this is the agenda. Um, you know, if if it's if this makes it harder to make a, a pre, take a preemptive unilateral U.S. strike, my own feeling is that's that's probably. Um, uh, beneficial, but that I thought that was just a higher risk play than I, I, I wanted to see the U.S. try. Um, but uh, you know, we'll see. That the people tell me and David that you know, come back in April because you know we'll we'll be the, the same exactly the same issues that existed before uh, Kim Jong Un's opening uh, come come back. Starting with the question of whether we'll have military exercise with South Korea in that kind of April time frame. Well, let's um, open this to all of you. Uh, questions on the book, questions on the world, uh, questions on how the book intersects with the world. <laughs> Jill, the mic coming. Thank you. Um, great, having read the book, it's terrific. And I always feel like I learned something. I'm not sure I know I can talk about quantum theory, but at least I have a sense of it. But two things um, that I wanted to ask you. One, um, in terms of the relationship in China between the party and the civil, quote unquote, part of the, uh, which, which you get into in terms of the conflict between the two. Um, my impression is that the president has moved the party sort of up in the, in the, uh, in terms of the, the importance of it, the importance that it plays. So I was wondering if you could comment on that, David, because you certainly talk about that in the book. And the other thing about our own policies and this move toward isolationism that uh, at least the White House seems to be trying to do, um, 
And the issue of the Changs, of bringing in um, the foreigners on visas, on which are indeed becoming less and less. Um, and where you think that will take us in terms of the challenges between the United States and, uh, and China, short term That's and a, maybe long term? a great uh, list of questions, Jill. Uh, so I think it is true that, that um, in uh, purging corruption within the party, um, she is well on his way to his goal of rehabilitating the party as the instrument of China, China's governance. Uh, the, the, if the party was seen as corrupt, uh, um, uh, held in contempt by the, by the public, its ability to exercise power would have over time um, diminished. And so I, I think um, understanding the Chinese Communist Party is at the center of this story is right. Um, the power of the intelligence service, the Ministry of State Security, I'm told, has declined some. It's been, a, as I said, a target of Xi's purge. Uh, it was seen as two Shanghainese. Uh, Fudan University in, in, in Shanghai is said to have a relationship with the Ministry of State Security, a little like Yale and the CIA. Uh, and, and Xi has been kind of going after the Shanghai faction um, in, in so many different ways. And it's, it's said that the party itself, the party's information department, once upon a time, China's intelligence service was in the party. It was the part, essentially the party's information bureau. So we may go back to something closer to that. I don't know. Um, others would, would know better than, than I. Um, Trump's uh, America first uh, nationalism, I, I, I think, um, is uh, in danger of doing real damage to our country's future, our economic prospects. I, I'm encouraged. You know, I mean, Davos is, you know, is hardly a model of the world we want to see. But the fact that the president decided he was going to go to the very symbol of what he campaigned against, um, you know, Steve Bannon's version of, of the devil's, uh, devil's chamber, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's interesting. But, the, um, you know, it's a world that, that's used to American leadership, uh, used to working through American-led institutions. And as Trump went after them, uh, with a lot of support from the country, the country, you know, the idea of the World Bank and the IMF and, and the UN, for that matter, uh, not all that popular with America. The Chinese are waiting with their own network of institutions, and certainly in Asia, that that's um, where the action will be. And that should worry everybody, because that, that goes to the heart of our, our, our future security. On the, final, on the question of Chinese, um, uh, interaction with America. If, I, if I'm under, understanding your question about visas, you mean the students who come here? Um, yeah, I'm not talking about the immigration issues, per se, but the but the right, kids. But the issue of, uh, of the kind of people who would be doing the kind of research. Yeah. So um, part of the problem, I think, is just getting a handle on this. Uh, we're such a wide open uh, country, to our everlasting credit, and Trump hasn't really changed that um, for all his talk. Um, the numbers that I found when I was researching a column on this is that there are about 350,000 Chinese students in America. It's an amazing number. It is one third of all foreign students in the United States are Chinese. If you walk around the university campus, you know you'll think, "Geez, you know, where am I?" Uh, that's so. Uh, those those uh, students um, are encouraged to. You know, be respectful of the, the motherland, and there's an association of Chinese students and scholars on every big campus, keeping an eye on people. Um, I think the last thing we should do is get uh, hysterical about Chinese students, and you know, are they have are they secretly doing this and that? We just need to be. That's why you need. You're either going to classify something where you say we're really going to have tight controls on on who looks at this. Or you're going to have it open with the understanding that people are going to take it, you know, they don't forget the, the material once they learn it. They'll take it back to wherever they're from. And that's just, that's just, that's the world we live in. So, um, and all the leadership want is sending their kids here, yes. which has the reverse opportunity that they go back and sort of explain that America isn't exactly 
the evil incarnate that you necessarily read in this? It's, so I, I think the thing I worry about, David, is, is the, the, the extent to which China, um, Chinese people um, are, are willing to engage in self-censorship as the price of you know, this wonderful bandwagon that's, that's making everybody rich. There's a case that uh, I referred to recently where a Chinese uh, senior at the University of Maryland gave a speech as she was getting ready to graduate. And, talked about how great freedom of speech is in America. And she was attacked on Chinese social media. She was just, you know, boom, you know, uh, to the point that she had to basically recant to protect herself. So that shouldn't be. I mean, that, that's, you know, and I could give you lots of other examples <clears throat> of people, institutions, individuals being subject to that kind of pressure. That, that shouldn't be, and uh, hopefully, this new effort by the NSC task force is going to is going to deal with that. Thanks very much, um, David. Um, I um, <clears throat> I will first of all say um, that I just returned a short while ago from a week in Santa Fe, which on its own is wonderful, but was where I read your book, and it's stunning. Um, but uh, that's no surprise. My experience of a David Ignatius book uh, uh, is, on the one hand, as David Sanger said, this was really fun. Uh, I raced all the way through it and then tried to figure out how the hell not to get to the end so I could stay with it. But the second thing about a David Ignatius book, in my view, is, um, it, is it is a way for one of the most experienced observers to be saying to people, I want you to think about this. Uh, neatly disguised in fun, fictional terms. And as I left the book, and as I thought about it uh, since reading it, the two questions that come up for me, and you've talked about it here, are uh, the sort of what keeps David Ignatius up at night other than writing books and librettos for operas, et cetera, is should we worry more about who gets the QC first or the race between the two entities that are really engaged in this race in the first place? What's the, what, what, to the extent that one can say one uh, is more important than the other, um, where, should our, where should our thinking be these days about what to worry most about? Well, uh, Jerry, that, that's, you couldn't say anything nicer than, uh, than what you did. And I, I just will note uh, the pleasure of my uh, career has been that uh, I stayed in David's and uh, my business of journalism. Uh, but I did find this uh, way, just as you say, to, to write uh, in a, uh, on a different template um, without having to footnote it. Um, but Smart more, move. <laughs> more important, um, without having to uh, have a prescriptive uh, judgment about complicated issues, in a, in a novel, you can let the characters express all the different sides of an argument, uh, as with the question of how we should organize uh, advanced research. Should it be classified or not? Well, the, the two sides of that argument are each, I think, compellingly pre presented in, in this in this book. If you write a column, as I do, uh, it's 750 words, and at the end you have to say, and you know, therefore, this is what we should do. And there are a lot of times when I'm not sure what the right answer is. Uh, and so I'll, you know, uh, often we'll sort of waffle. But in a, in a novel, that's the whole point, is you want each character and point of view in an argument to be compelling. And to, and to seem real, so that's that's exactly what I've I've loved about 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 doing. Uh, what should we worry about most? I, I I'll, I'll kind of give you a non-answer. What we should worry about most is our, our own country, and the degree to which to which it's divided. Uh, to, I think now verging on being dysfunctional at the uh, legislative level, uh, and in a way that now is a national security problem. I, I had a column recently in which I talk to some former four stars, very senior people, who said, um, 
aren't we so divided that if we went to war, if we were really challenged, um, we would have a terrible uh, deficit relative to our adversaries. Our adversaries see the divisions, and man, they're just pounding them. So that's what, that's what, I, that's what I worry about. I think our big national security worry isn't out there. I'm glad we're thinking more about China. It's, it's right here, and uh, it doesn't seem to be getting better. Mike coming around. Thank you very much, Larry Checo. And David, I just want to say I really appreciate and enjoy your columns. Uh, very insightful. Thank you. Um, you've managed to scare the bejeebus out of us with regards to the tsunami of technology that's on our way. Um, you know, getting back to what's going on in our country, this whole anti science atmosphere that has been created and this lack of research and development that we've cut off funding for. I mean, any, any number of things. I mean, so to your point, which you just said, we have to look at our own country. I think you're absolutely right. But how do we get around this? I mean, how do we change this dynamic? We are part of this international community, whether we like yeah. it or not. Thank you. Well, I mean, that, that would be my answer, is that, is that uh, it turns out the global economy has a lot more momentum uh, than Donald Trump, than the uh, forces that are uh, in reaction. Uh, against this world. Uh, you know, it is striking that uh, Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, but our major companies are continuing to act in compliance, our state governments, local governments. Uh, and it, it tells you what we know from other things, which is that the federal government's power uh, is not, uh, it's not, it's not total. We're not ch China. Uh, and so I, uh, I think that that momentum is is gonna is gonna uh, protect us. Um, I sh I'd be I'd be making a mistake if I left the audience with a sense that this ter terrible technological darkness lies ahead, in which we um, the opposite is is likely to be to be true. I, I think over time, technology will help make the internet safer than it is. I think we'll end up having. You know, um, we'll build in more security in the cyber world than we've than we've had. I think um, the ability. I'm, I'm not kidding about quantum computers uh, making possible uh, designer drugs. You know, having that kind of computational power will allow us to solve the most important problems that there are. So I, it's not um, it, it's not all that grim. And as David said, I just final point. Um, one thing that we learned after the Manhattan Project, you know, the biggest secret of the war on which everything was riding, was that it was thoroughly penetrated by the Russians. You know, the biggest secrets we had were being stolen. Now, you know, they, they helped Russia get nuclear weapons more quickly than they might have, but it didn't, the worst happened those, those you know, spy cases are incredible. The worst happened, but it didn't, it didn't really affect, uh, I don't think, the, the balance once the balance was, was established. So um, I don't think, I suppose we got the quantum computer first. I just don't see that knowledge remaining, the, the, the pathways that enable the final steps remaining secret and for very long, as David says. And the competition itself is useful. I mean, I, I was a correspondent for the Times in Japan at a moment that we had a lot of people wanting to seal off the American market to Japanese yep. cars. Well, yep. what has made your cars safer and more intelligent has been the competition with Japan. I mean, over time, yes, the Japanese seized a big part of the market. Yes, they're building a lot of cars in the US, despite what you may, may read uh, from, uh, from some. And, um, but more importantly, they forced a technological change that wasn't going to happen that fast. So, right here. David, as the master of intelligence, if you were asked to be head of the Central Intelligence Agency, would you take the job, number one? <laughs> and, and number two, how do the Europeans look at China? Do they see China as we see it, as a major ch military challenge? Boy, if there is a yeah. hearing, a Senate hearing for confirmation that I would like to cover, 
it would be the one for you for CIA director. I, I would not give uh, that up to any other reporter on Earth. <laughs> let, it, let it just be said. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd never get it. The security clearance. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very happy where, where I am. It's nice to be able to, to, to write about these things, but, um, you know, I... I Right, writing about foreign policies ended up being the work the, that I did with my career, much as, as with David, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I feel guilty sometimes that I you know, didn't choose another path as a young man, but I didn't. So, uh, you know. Uh, what was your other question? How Europeans Yeah. So I, I worry that the Europeans are at the stage that we were 10 years ago, where they're just racing to try to be nice to the Chinese because they are terrified of losing access to the market. The US companies are much less that way now because they've just had so much of their intellectual property stolen. Uh, it's very hard to, to export the money you make in China. This idea that China was uh, just a shower of gold that everybody had to be there because this was the future of every business um, is less true. It's, it's tr it is true still in one industry that interests me, and that's the, the movie business. Uh, Chinese ticket sales now approach those in the U.S., and it is increasingly thought in Hollywood that if you know if if you ha don't, if, I wouldn't look for the Quantum Spy to be a movie because you know. <laughs> about the Chinese intelligence service. That's not going to happen. So I think um, the, the, the Europeans, uh, I worry, uh, are fear, afraid of offending, um, pullback, or instrumental. I hope what Australia has done, there's no country that's more vulnerable to Chinese economic power than Australia. And Australia very courageously, uh, under uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, has said, sorry. You know, we're going we're gonna to get much tougher about Chinese influence in Australia. We're going to pass new laws. We're going to make it harder for them to contribute money. We're going to be, you know, more, more careful in looking at our, our Chinese uh, fellow Australian citizens and what they do. It, it's a very tough move, and it's, it, it had enormous impact in the U.S. Because I think a lot of what we're doing now to look at Chinese influence operations is basically saying, let's try to do what Australia did. So I think that would be a model for us, yeah, but really for Europe. I'm sad this wouldn't be made into a movie because there are some incredibly cinematic scenes, particularly as you move on into the book. Right back here, ma'am. Thank you. In the course of reflecting on all of this powerful computing technology, did it, I imagine you had some thoughts about artificial intelligence and the potential loss of human control of this power? Well, I, I did. I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to really um, have an opinion in this debate that Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, others have warned that um, AI is in, you know, in danger of having <coughs> AI systems that can reproduce themselves, that can write AI programs, that the machine learning, the machine ends up being dominant. Uh, I, I, I very, I follow carefully advances in what's called autonomous systems in warfare. Uh, the shorthand is killer robots, and that worries me a lot. I mean, you know, you can basically, we're at the point where I think technologically you could <laughs> scan in my face, you know, my digital signature, and then tell the robot, go kill David Ignatius. And, and that we're that's already we're already at that at that at that at that point. Um, well, since your Apple Ten phone is scanning your face, it's just a question of you know getting into Apple's database or putting that killer app on the. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody in the intelligence committee once said in a public forum, you know. Selfies are the best thing that ever happened for us. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. Yeah. Right back here, sir. David, have uh, have you heard of anybody in China buying your book? <laughs> That's a, a mischievous question from my friend Tom Gorlogos. Um I was not long ago with with a. 
a senior Chinese official, not otherwise described. Uh, and I said at the end of this conversation, uh, Mr. Official, I really would have loved to bring you a copy of a new novel, but I, I thought it might be inappropriate. And uh, the next time I'll go. And this official said, uh, I like spy novels. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I don't know that he's read it, but he sure, he sure had been briefed on it. Great, so we're down <laughs> to about nine minutes. So what we're gonna do is grab two questions at a time uh, and uh, make the question short and the answer short, and we'll try to get everybody in, starting right here and then over here. So thank you for facilitating a really insightful uh, discussion. I want to go back to the, uh, the theme of national security and our apprehensions around it. And it seems to me that underlying those are really our concerns around sovereignty and uh, patriotism and nationalism. And you know, the Treaty of Westphalia was a long time ago. And when I think about intelligence, when I think about even economic progress, that we have to cooperate. So I work in global health. And there are uh, many developments that we would not have been able to achieve had it not been without the cooperation of others or us being able to do research in countries where disease is epidemic. And so what I'd like to understand uh, and your thoughts on is how does the us and them in terms of framing it around national security help us against the inevitable cooperation for climate change, for example? There's no going, not one country that is going to benefit. So how can we think about intelligence, talent across borders so that we're talking about global security as opposed to national security. I can ask you just to hand off the mic right here. Uh, David, uh, I, I, I just wanted to uh, ask you to sort of talk about the implications of that anecdote. Uh, about free speech, uh, you know, I think if you were to sort of construct a model of how innovation happens and how economic growth happens, we would argue in broad terms that it has a lot to do with free markets and free speech. Uh, China uh, censors access to uh, to the to uh, the internet. Uh, have they invented a new model, uh, one that sort of flies in the face of tra traditional free free market? Uh, economics and notions about free speech? Those are two just terrific uh, questions. Um, uh, on the, the first and the borderless world of problems, um, but the segmented world of solutions, um, I think that's changing, not fast enough, and certainly not in the intelligence sphere in terms of intelligence agencies. Those are the secrets countries guard, partly because, you know, the, the, I mean, Britain's power in the future, as vis-a-vis -vis Europe, let's say, is in part, it's really good at telling you things that you want to know. It's part of, part, part of their national, national power. But uh, I'm struck by how uh, transnational groups, private groups, corporations most obviously, but I think of made sans frontier. I mean, I have a daughter who's an infectious disease doctor, a fellow at Johns Hopkins. You know, her dream is that she would someday work for uh, MSF. Uh, so she wants to be part of that global organization uh, because it's so good. Uh, one interesting fact is that many of the things that intelligence agencies uniquely could do uh, a decade ago uh, now are being privatized. There is now emerging a, a, a network of satellites that are going to be able to map the Earth from space the way Google Earth maps it from, from Earth, uh, you know, going down your street. I mean, not quite that level, but pretty darn close. And there are already applications um, let's say that you're a hedge fund trader and you want to know whether to buy Target stock or Walmart stock. Well, there are programs that will analyze the parking lots of every Target and Walmart store in a given market. And they'll tell you what traffic is, you know, week by week, day by day. 
That's just one tiny example of what's becoming powerful, of, of becoming commercialized. I was asking the other day, somebody knowledgeable, so if we've got, basically, uh, we've privatized the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, used to be our super secret spy satellite agency, are we going to privatize the NSA? Are we going to have uh, private SIGINT collection? Well, that's not as far off as you think. <laughs> I mean, there, are, there seem to be people who are coming in with applications that, I mean, it's kind of scary. W worth noting, because I, I know this from having read this in the New York Times, the satellite, <laughs> having written this in the New York Times, the satellite technology that you're discussing used over Target is what they are now trying to grab on to put inexpensive satellites up over North Korea to watch the mobile missiles. Well, it's, uh, you know, and if, if the government doesn't do it, we can, they can buy it from uh, well, commercial vendors. They are buying it from commercial so, vendors because they can't get there that fast. Um, on, uh, on Finley's question about, about uh, free speech and the open society, I, I do think that's our secret sauce as a country. Um, I'm not sure that a regimented, party-controlled uh, China can be as flexible, innovative, risk-taking in particular. I mean, China freezes up when, when people are you know, in this controlled society are asked to take risks. Because uh, everybody's afraid, you know, you take the wrong one and you're, you know. So I think that's, that remains our enormous advantage. The problem is that what the things that we learn by taking risks are easily stolen. And then you plug those into a, you know, a country that is good at product development. Look at every, every phone we've got is, is assembled. It ain't assembled in America. China also has very good physics, phys, physics graduates, you know, the infrastructure for, for um, but, but I, like you, Finley, I, I think um, there, there is a reason that innovation flourishes uh, in this country and in more regimented countries doesn't. And uh, I just, I hope, I hope that doesn't change. There isn't any intellectual mood in the United States now that, and again, what, what should we really worry about? That, that's right at the top of my list. I'll just close this by noting that the vice chancellor of Oxford, a marvelous woman who came to them from Yale, said at a conference I was at this summer that this is a great uh, season for Oxford to try to get the top uh, researchers in America to bring their, move their labs to, to Britain because people are beginning to worry that funding won't be available to keep their labs going, keep their postdocs, so you know they're ripe for the picking. That terrified me. I mean, I, I thought, man, that's that's a, that's a picture of how America goes down. You know, as as top researchers say, I'm not sure this is really a place I can do my best work anymore. Ooh. Alma, you uh, got us here, so you're going to get us out of here. Well, you're the uh, you're going to be the last question for us, and uh, I'm sure if we, I missed anybody. You can grab David on the way out. Well, I see the clock is 1:30. <clears throat> and I didn't want to leave today without thanking you, David, and you, David Ignatius, for enlightening us, as you always do. Uh, if you think it's just your books, that's good enough. But it's more than just your books and more than the articles that you write. Well, you can see by the crowd in this room that we look to you for enlightenment. I found that the things that you write in your books happen. You write about doctor. Just last week, somebody was indicted. You're on the ground. You're in real time. And you make us think by the things you write, not only in your books, but in every day. You both are Aspen quality. <laughs> and we love you for that. Thank and we you. thank you. Thanks, Alma. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, all right. That means we're all going to get right. traffic on the way home, you know? <laughs> that's, uh, that's some good news. Thank you, Alma. Thanks. 
Thank you, man. That was fun. That was really great. Thank you, David. Uh, Ode. Yes. I'm going to send a short review of your book.